Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. God's sure word that serves as a firm foundation for us this morning is the gospel reading where we are taken into the circle of Jesus and his disciples. The very odd and very bold request where Jesus redefines for us what being great truly is all about. Several weeks ago, Yahoo Sports had an article online talking about the greatest athletes of all time, probably inspired by Tom Brady winning yet another Super Bowl championship. They had this article and picture of all of the greatest athletes in all of their perspective sports, from Muhammad Ali to Michael Jordan to Serena Williams and all sorts of other athletes who throughout their careers showed themselves to be among the best and the very elite in their respected sports. We could have a long conversation on anything if it began like this. The greatest television show of all time is Hope, what did you say? Gilligan's Island. Wow. Does anybody else agree with that? No? No, you're alone. You're alone on an island on that one. The greatest song of all time is blank. Whatever. What one? Don't stop believing. Don't stop believing. Hold on to that feeling. Sound, sound works well. We could have all kinds of silly conversations if we start talking about the greatest whatever. One of the most important things that we have done as a family in our first month and a half living in our home is try and discover what the best pizza and bagel places are nearby. We've tried, I think, four pizza places, and we know which ones we will probably go back to and which ones we certainly will not. The bagels, even on my way to church this morning, I drove past a bagel place that says they have the best bagels in New Jersey. The mini golf place in Jefferson, which apparently was voted the best in northern New Jersey, which is probably the only one in northern New Jersey, but every company, every business, every person, no matter their profession, we strive to be great. We want to be the best. You don't want to be just, oh yeah, he's, I, 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 as long as I'm a decent pastor, that's good enough for me. You want to be a good pastor. You want to be a good teacher. You want to be the greatest employee that your company has. And then maybe you get all kinds of exciting accolades with it. That's how we function. That's how we get ahead. That's the way, in many respects, that we are wired. We don't want to just be middle of the pack. We don't certainly want to be in the bottom rung. We want to be in that upper echelon. We want to be the greatest, whatever profession we may have. Well, today we see these two disciples with a similar motivation and desire. But we have to place it into its proper context. And in our gospel reading, we are told that Jesus is walking towards Jerusalem. Anytime in the gospel you hear Jesus walking towards Jerusalem, in essence, what the gospel writer is saying is this is the next step in his journey to the cross. And so as we come to the end of Lent, everything about the end of Jesus' life is ramping up. And so we are told that Jesus brings his disciples closer towards Jerusalem, knowing exactly what was to come for himself. And so because he knew, he says, you know what, it's time for me to, again, share with you why we're going to Jerusalem. Taking the twelve again, Jesus began to tell them what was to happen to him. Seeing, saying, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be. And here's where Jesus begins to lay out for them yet again what exactly the next couple weeks are going to look like for him. Just look at these 
all of these words in red. The Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes. They will condemn him to death. They will deliver him to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. This is not an uplifting message that Jesus is delivering to the disciples. He's saying, listen, we are going to Jerusalem and everything that can happen to one person that's bad is about to happen to me. I will be delivered. I will be arrested. I will be abandoned. I will be destroyed. And no sooner does Jesus talk about his pending torture and pain and death than you have two yahoos who say, well, this seems like a good time for me to ask, what about me? What can I get? You have James and John, the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder. Often the sons of thunder is depicted as this bull in a china shop mentality where they just kind of go bulldozing into a place without really thinking things through or worried about what kind of wreckage they may leave behind. And so here, they hear their master and teacher talk about his upcoming death and destruction, and all they really want to know is, well, how can we benefit from this? James and John, sons of Zebedee, came to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. That in and of itself is a pretty bold thing. There's a movie out on Netflix, I think, right now. We haven't watched it yet, but the whole premise is Yes Day. And so whatever the children ask mom and dad, they have to say yes to. My children have tried to get us to fall into that trap before, but we are not the brightest bulbs in the box, but way too smart for that. If your children or grandchildren came up to you or your spouse came up to you and said, for an entire day, you had to do whatever I wanted you to do. This is what they asked Jesus. We want you to do for us whatever we ask. Let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left hand in your glory. James and John, even though they just heard Jesus talk about his own suffering, cared very little about that. James, Jesus, make us great. That's really what they were asking here. Jesus, we know that you have a lot of friends. We know that you know a lot of people. Prophets and priests and kings and, and all of these people from the Old Testament. But when you get into your glory, when you're sitting up there on your heavenly throne, if we could be right there on your right side and your left side, if we could have those positions of power and authority that would be awesome. Jesus, whatever we ask, please grant us this level of greatness. How tone deaf they must have sounded to Jesus. How selfish and arrogant that request was in that moment. When Jesus is trying to set the hearts of disciples on what is lying ahead, we see in a moment of pure selfishness and short-sightedness that they cared nothing about that. They only wanted to be great for themselves. Uh-oh. Jim, if you can go to the next slide. Just push the... There we go. And this is the incredible too. When... The other ten, the other ten disciples hear about this. We are told they become indignant with them. Now, why do you think they were so disgusted and annoyed by those two disciples? Not because they made such a request, but because they made the request before the other disciples could make that request. What do you mean, you two want to be Jesus' best, greatest disciples? That's us! We've been with Jesus through far more. We've trusted him far greater than you have. How dare you even consider the fact that you two might be the greatest. We're the greatest. 
And so Jesus senses this little tension among them. He, he senses the little back and forth moaning and groaning amongst the disciples. And so what Jesus does for us then is he redefines greatness. Jesus is far more concerned with people truly understanding what greatness is actually about. He says, come over here. Let me have a word with you guys. And he talks about all of these rulers of the Gentiles, all of these rulers of this world, all of these kings. And he says, there are people all over the place that lord their power over others, that use their position and their notoriety to manipulate other people, to take advantage of other people, to get what they want so that they themselves could be great. But that better not be the way it is for you. He says, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. Jesus in this moment is redefining greatness. Greatness is not about power. It's not about position. It's not about pedigree. Greatness is truly defined in how you see your fellow man. And this is not just something Jesus would tell them, but this is something that in those coming days, Jesus would show them. As he journeyed closer and closer into Jerusalem, closer and closer to the cross. You see, for Jesus, he was not only there to inform and instruct, but he was there to embody what servanthood truly looked like. What it was really all about. And so God calls us in this moment to be great. But not to be in a greatness that is defined by this world or by our abilities at work or our successes in any other avenue or arena of life. God calls us to put our fellow man before ourselves. He says this is what true greatness is all about. Having an attitude of humility. Having an attitude of service. God is not asking us to be the goat. He's not asking us or expecting us to be the greatest of all time. He just says, be faithful. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. God calls us to serve. Perhaps one of the greatest of all time, Muhammad Ali, said this. He said, at home, I am a nice guy, but I don't want the world to know that. Humble people I've found don't get very far in life. There's probably a lot of truth to that statement. But Jesus doesn't seem to care. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for who you are and for how you redefine greatness for us. Lord, we know that there are so many things that this world says is important and necessary, and they throw awards and accolades at us. But we know that in your kingdom, that's not what true greatness is. It's about humbly following you, serving brothers and sisters who are in need, and fully trusting in you above all things, not concerned or worried about ourselves and our own standing, not trying to make our own names be great, but by making your name great through our humble and obedient service. Lord, this is not an easy task, and it's one that we fail miserably at far too often. But Lord, help us to do right by you. Help us to serve as you have served us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.